Kamala Harris makes history. I accept your nomination to be president of the United States of America. Becoming the first black woman and the first candidate ever of Asian descent to lead a major party's presidential ticket. Harris won the affection and support of her party this week in a boisterous even euphoric convention. America, hope is making a comeback. But the question now is this, can she convince a small handful of swing voters in states like Michigan, Georgia, and Pennsylvania that she'd make a better president than Donald Trump? Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and Moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. So Thursday night, everyone was buzzing about a surprise guest at the Democratic National Convention. Would it be Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Mitt Romney? Mitt Romney is one of Beyonce's dancers. But the surprise guest turned out to be Kamala Harris, because this wasn't supposed to be her nomination. Just cast your minds back to what was probably the most stunning debate in presidential history, and you'll understand why. So here we are at the tail end of one of the strangest summers in recent memory, and Harris is the nominee. The big question before Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, can they think of a way to stop her momentum apart from insulting her? Joining me tonight to discuss this and more, Eugene Daniels is Politico's White House correspondent and co-author of Playbook. Mark Leibovich is my colleague and a staff writer at The Atlantic. Susan Page is the Washington bureau chief at USA Today. And Ali Vitale is a Capitol Hill correspondent at NBC News and the author of Electable, Why America Hasn't Put in a Woman in the White House Yet. So, yet. My crystal ball was working. Yeah, no, 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 no. You're, uh, you were going to be right sooner or later, right? It's going to be. Well, thank you all for, for, for joining me. Eugene, let's start with you. I just have a sort of a big general question for everybody. It's like, I want to get your, you're all just off the plane back from the convention. Uh, your dominant impression of Kamala Harris uh, right now and, and your dominant understanding of momentum and what it means for the campaign. Uh, how does she translate some obvious momentum out of the last few weeks and this last week, especially in, in, into the swing states for the 75 days or so before the general? Yeah, I think objectively she was effective in her speech, right? I think she had to introduce herself to a lot of people who didn't know her. And as someone who's covered her this entire time as her as vice president when she was running, she doesn't talk about her family and kind of emotions a lot. She talked about that quite a bit. But she also did this thing that's really interesting. And I was on the floor um, for like five hours waiting for Beyonce, but also Kamala Harris. <laughs> um, and she um, kind of reclaimed patriotism. They handed out a lot of flags, which is not something you're always thinking about at a Democratic National Convention. Yeah. The chance of USA, she talked about this election as one of her and Tim Walls and their stories can only happen here in America, Barack Obama in 2008, yeah. talking about her parents who were immigrants that came here and they would only meet in this country in that way. And then talking to the American people and saying, I'm just like you, the kinds of things that you deal with. You know, I came from the middle class. She's definitely not middle class anymore, but I came from the middle class, you know, those kinds of things. It is trying to draw out the fact that, um, in her estimation, Donald Trump is not someone that sh you know, people who are in the middle class should see themselves in. She talked about herself as a prosecutor and that he, um, the only person who has ever been, he has ever been his, um, that he's ever, he's ever worked for is himself, right? She works for the people. Those are the things that's really interesting. On the momentum, 
I've never seen anything like this in the Democratic Party, probably since 2008. And the excitement that was in there, the excitement that was on that stage um, is palpable and you could like really feel it. Mm -hmm. But if those people on the stage don't get out for her, it's one thing to get on stage and you can yeah. sell a book and you know, you're up there and, and all of a sudden people are gonna- I mean, she had them at things. hello, that's not the had point. Them at hello, yeah. But yeah. now they have to keep doing that and they're gone, they need to get out on the road. And I think they need to do more than just go to big cities they have talked about this rural strategy that they have. They have to actually do something with that. Yeah, Susan, you know, the momentum. Most, the yeah. most sure-footed 33 days in modern American political history yeah. that we've seen. She's gone from being- That's a big statement. No, to, no <laughs> she, she, in 33 days, she went from being number two on a ticket that was trailing, and now she has made virtually not a single mistake and has claimed the nomination and momentum and got, us, got the Democrats back to an, to an even up race. Now, she's got some, Challenges ahead the next 74 days. She's going to have to do an interview, maybe more. <laughs> We're going to get to that. Yeah. She's yeah. going to have to. She's going to have to do a debate. I think she goes into that with some real advantages against uh, Donald Trump. Oh, talk about that. What do well, you, mean? you know, I moderated the last debate she did. <laughs> yes. Which was uh, the vice presidential debate in 2020. That's such a good flex. Um, <laughs> and, <yes. laughs> yeah. I mean, we all did, yeah, but yeah. we don't talk about um, it. And, yeah. you know, that was a campaign where she was didn't show nearly as much sure-footedness as she has now, but she is a good debater. She chose her prosecutorial chops. Yeah. Um, let's go to the blue team, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I agree with what you just, with everything you just said, Susan, about Kamala Harris. I, I think she is propelled by forces well beyond herself. One, the sort of pent-up release around the unhappiness around the Biden at the top of the ticket. I mean, that was such a tense and unhappy and really kind of moribund feeling at the beginning of the summer, kind of came to a head around the debate. I mean, this is all why there will be documentaries and books about this summer entirely. But I think she clearly benefited from that. Uh, she clearly benefited from the, the choice of Tim Walls to this point. Uh, but also just the release. I mean, I think the, the this week was a culmin has been a culmination of that. The question is, you can't be a, it can't be a culmination. It has to continue. I mean, and the question is, will this propel her forward? Uh, it looks like everyone's on board. I think the week went really well. I think there was some awkwardness around Biden's sort of... Um, you know, keynote, goodbye, good riddance, whatever, whatever you want to yeah. say it was, but that kind of had to be dealt with, and they kind of dispatched with it on Monday night. And you know, I think this will all be defined by what happens in November. Right. It oh. propels you forward until it doesn't, right? Like we're yeah. going to find out what the ceilings are. We already know where Trump's ceiling is, where his floor is. It's somewhere in the low 30s. That's all the conventional knowledge. For her, she's untested, even in the way of yes, she's been on the ballot as a vice president, but she dropped out in 2020 before mm -hmm. anyone could vote for her or not vote for her. And I remember thinking when I was covering that campaign that that's a blessing to her and also hard for journalists who are trying to make sense of what a Kamala coalition actually looks like. I do think she has shaken off any of the ghosts of the 2020 uh, debate cycle, all of that. But quick, quick question for you and whoever uh, wants to jump in. Remind us why it didn't go well for her. In, in that. How much time do I have? <laughs> Give me the 30 second version. I, I do think that the short answer there was she was directionless in a field where people had clearly established lanes, clearly established brands, and she herself seemed at times, and I'm sure you guys would agree, confused as to what her policy positions yeah. were. Mm -hmm. She ended up in these circular spirals of, okay, but is your health care policy good with private insurance or is it not good with private insurance? What do you mean when you say you want a public option? I remember we would just go round in circles. The campaign apparatus didn't have a clear strategy within it. I reported that partially in my book, or a hierarchy, which of course was part of the problem. But I think the one thing that really struck me about Harris uh, last night was that that's gone. But she's she letting a, it be. She pays in the a back. price for that campaign yeah. uh, because she took some positions like uh, banning fracking. Oh, yeah, that yes. sounds like a great idea. Yes, I, at the end, I was for Medicare for All. Mm -hmm. These are positions she doesn't want to hold now. So she can either be targeted as somebody who is super liberal with these positions or someone who flip flopped on Yeah, her. but she hasn't to this point. And, and that, I think, underscores one that, you know, she might be a little bit bulletproof on this, but also this all is predicated on the other side having some kind of disciplined messaging machine, right, and right, the right. guy at the top of the yeah. ticket is leading it, and it's, it has not been focused. Let me, yeah. let me, let me um, pivot to, to something interesting about the, the Democratic National Convention versus the Republican. I mean, so, so the RNC, um, you had the li one living ex-Republican president, George W. Bush, not there. Mm -hmm. 2012, 
standard bearer, Mitt Romney, not there. No living Republican former vice president there, including <laughs> Donald Trump's former vice president, who like won't in, in, endorse him. DNC felt like a kind of a gangs I'll hear moment. Wait, watch, I, I, Michelle Obama sort of set the tone for, for, for what I'm talking about. Let's watch this for a second. She understands that most of us will never be afforded the grace of failing forward. We will never benefit from the affirmative action of generational wealth. If we bankrupt a business or choke in a crisis, we don't get a second, third, or fourth chance. If things don't go our way, we don't have the luxury of whining or cheating others to get further ahead, no. We don't get to change the rules so we always win. If we see a mountain in front of us, we don't expect there to be an escalator waiting to take us to the top. No. By the way, just noting for the record that the, the gap between her ta Michelle Obama's political talent and her lack of desire to be in politics <laughs> is the greatest gap in in, in American politics in American life. Yeah. I mean, that is a and talented that was the greatest speech of the that was a, well. So this is no, this Tim is this Walsh. goes to my question. <laughs> you think Tim Walz? We'll, we'll vote yeah. later. Um, <laughs> well, this is my question. They brought the whole team mm -hmm. and and very effective advocacy for Kamala Harris. Trump was alone at his convention. It was the Trump family production. Does that matter that, that, that there was one pretty effective, hard-hitting speech after another against Trump? What, is it, what does it pretend? I, th I think it tells you, for voters who are like trying to figure out Vice President Harris, everybody told a different aspect of her, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that is something when you're trying to reintroduce yourself, you need, you need these validators over and over and over again. Michelle Obama continues to be the most admired woman on Earth, right? There's no one better to have Earth. on Earth, on the planet, <laughs> and maybe other planets too. You know, I don't know. I haven't talked to Mars. Taylor Swift. Maybe no, no more. No, no. no. Um, <laughs> don't do start know? that fight. Don't come for Taylor. Don't come for all the Swifties here. Yeah. But but you also have Barack Obama, who um, goes for a long time and, and has talked about um, and been affected by Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, all of these folks who were mainstays in our culture, um, but also talk talking about different things. You had Hillary Clinton talking about the glass ceiling again, but Vice President Harris not doing that. Donald Trump not having anyone but kind of like his vanquished enemies and yeah. his family members doing the validating for him, I think the swing voters are paying attention to that. Go ahead. Validators are essential for all the obvious reasons, but for women candidates yes. specifically, yes. and there are so many studies that point to this, and so having those people on stage, yes, that's the point of a convention, mm -hmm. but it's also something that so many of the people who work in the Harris orbit and in the larger Democratic Party have studied this, they have lived this in 16 and 20, they are living Living the result of Hillary Clinton's loss. And it's striking to me, everyone I think was looking for Kamala Harris to have a moment where, will she wear the white suit and <laughs> go to the yes. suffragettes? Will she lean in on her firstness, on her historic nature? And she didn't on purpose because everyone who looks at her knows that she is historic. Mm -hmm. They know that she occupies spaces that no black woman has ever occupied before and that she's breaking glass ceilings. But the way that they spoke to it, Michelle Obama did this, Kamala Harris did this, Maya Harris did this. They told their stories through the women who were powerful and impactful in their lives. Matriarchy was such a thread that ran through this. When Michelle Obama talks about the cliff that women and people yep. of color can fall off of because of their non-white, non-maleness, there are people who feel extremely seen and heard in that. You don't have to say, I'm first. You just have to say that. People know what you're talking about, and it's just as impactful and just as important. California Senator LaFonza Butler, I did an interview with her um, while I was there, and I asked her about this, and I said, is she going to do that? Should she? And she said, black women do not need to remind y'all we yeah. are black women. <laughs> y'all will remind us that we're black women. I thought that was such an interesting point, because they don't have to go out there and say that, because the world will remind black women over and over and over again that they are black, that they are woman, yeah. that they are a black woman, and that is something that that Vice President Harris clearly knows. The choice of a dark color, Simone Sanders, her former aide and now at MSNBC, um, talked about it as a, a point to saying to people, no, we need to get to work. Mm -hmm. I'll wear the white later. Right, right. Wear. No, that, that, that's interesting. You, you, you raise a, 
another aspect of the convention, which I, in my mind, I was thinking it's kind of the normie convention. Hmm. Um, normie in the, in the sense that, I mean, look, the, the uh, attacks on, on Trump were direct. They were not demure at all. No. Um, not they went, no. That, they went right at it. Um, but the, the, the normie quality is Thursday night. Adam Kinzinger, Republican, coming out and saying, hey, I, I've met these Democrats, my fellow Republicans. They're normal. They're just like you and me. Veteran after veteran after well, veteran. Kamala Harris talking very tough about America's adversaries, talking about the lethality of, of American armed forces, not just sad stories about veterans, yeah. right, which are important, and but are the traditional comfort area for it. But this is, this is, the, this is hard hitting. USA, USA, which is not a chant that you would think, as you note, yeah. you would hear. So like, I, 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 I'm wondering if you can speak to the question of whether that would matter for the Nikki Haley voters. Yes, that I think it would. I, because I think you see a, not just so much a piecing together of You a say story. there was such urgency, I feel no. like you're a Nikki Haley voter. <laughs> I think, like, uh, we're, as we're, a Nikki Haley voter. time out there together, yeah, you yeah, and I. Are. I will say this. Yeah, we will, um, I mean, there is a coalition that, first of all, there's a reassembling of a coalition of black and brown voters, younger voters, that Joe Biden was having real trouble with. Yeah. You also have, I mean, we haven't even mentioned AOC. We've only mentioned Kinzinger once. Jeff just mentioned yes. Kinzinger. But I mean, yeah, there is actually quite a bit of like sort of centrist Republican energy or potential growth there. Where is the Trump growth uh, strategy? I mean, yes, the base right. is energized, but are, is that base tired? And like, is, is this RFK's endorsement count as a, as a, as a growth strategy? Susan, where is the growth? Is there growth? For, for, for Trump, Trump? No, I think, yeah. well, I think we know that Trump has a ceiling. Um, as you mentioned, uh, and the question is, can you put together a coalition that's bigger than that? And and uh, um, and that's her task. I thought it was interesting that her speech last night was directed not at the people in the hall. It was not a, yeah. a speech designed to get them all ginned up, although they were just on their own. It was designed for people watching in the hall, watching on TV at home uh, or on social media who are not avid Democrats who are thinking about is can she address questions about the border that's been raised? Can she address? questions about inflation. Can I see her as a credible commander in chief? And that's why I think you saw so many military people up there on the street. So, so watch this. Um, this is uh, one excerpt from, uh, from her speech where she's going at something which is obviously an important issue, the constitutional challenge posed by post-January 6 Donald Trump. But I, I always wonder if compared to inflation and other issues, if this matters. Listen to this. I want to hear your reaction. In many ways, Donald Trump is an unserious man. <laughs> but the consequences, but the consequences of putting Donald Trump back in the White House are extremely serious. Consider the power he will have, especially after the United States Supreme Court just ruled that he would be immune from criminal prosecution. Just imagine Donald Trump with no guardrails. The question is, does this discourse matter to pocketbook voters? I think it does, and the reason is because the way that she is describing Donald Trump is as not the scary, dim, you know, democracy-shaking person who's going to destroy all the things as as Joe Biden did, but as someone who's unserious, right? And that if we put him in there, it, it's going to be bad. When she she didn't talk about it in the terms of democracy, she has framed this election as a question of freedom, which is completely different. And I think for voters. Black and brown voters, young voters, poor voters, the idea of being free to do what they want is something that hits stronger than like protecting the world and from, from Donald Trump because he's a danger to democracy in the way that Joe Biden was doing it. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I also think that, I mean, the unserious word I think was very effective. Yeah. It was understated, it was dismissive at the same time, and then she she kind of juxtaposed that with, with the catastrophic consequences of it. I mean, that was a very 
plain spoken. And as I was sitting in the hall, I mean, it, it was deathly quiet in that moment. Yeah. And I also, I wanted to use the, word, use the word catastrophic rather than very dangerous. But that's mm -hmm. just me as an editor. No, but I, <laughs> no, but I thank you. Um, no, I actually thought that was her best moment. And in the hall, I, I mean, everyone was like, that's a home run. I thought in the hall it felt more like a double, maybe. Mm -hmm. But when I saw it digested on video and in clips and so forth, it certainly seemed elevated. And that seemed to be what people clung to, which I thought was very effective. And yeah. so effective in getting under Trump's skin. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, you saw that from the flood of tweets uh, that he posted um, uh, during the speech, including things like, where's, where's Hunter? Hunter? Yeah. Well, you know, where, Hunter may be in Santa Barbara yeah. <laughs> uh, vacationing with Joe Biden, who was almost unmentioned among convention delegates uh, once he had left the hall. Um, tr Trump, I think, is still struggling to figure out how to respond to this very sly attack that doesn't make him the, 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 the risk to democracy. It makes him uh, Moxim is a kind of comical Can figure. Can I also just add that word freedom, you know where it started being successful? In the early referendums on abortion yep. and reproductive access. Yep. Democrats found success in red states because they were able to reclaim that word and speak to the people who, party aside, say, hey, I just want to do what I want to do. Yes. I don't want the government involved. That transcends partisanship, and we've seen it. I keep thinking back to covering an Ohio ballot measure in the dog days of August in an off year that got put on the ballot mere weeks beforehand, and millions of people turned out for a race that was about abortion but didn't have that word on the ballot, mm -hmm. and it, to me, spoke volumes about where we're going in this first post-Roe presidential Mind your own referendum. damn business. Yes. That is the yes. essence exactly. of... I, I, I've got to ask falsehood. about... Um, I've got to ask about talking about things that could help Donald Trump's campaign, um, which is a little bit sputtering, everybody agrees. Um, RFK Jr., endorsement. Does it matter? A little bit. You know, I think it's helped. I don't think it's a big deal because his support doesn't all go to to, to Trump. Uh, but but I th you know, if you've got if we're going to have a very close election, which are the only elections we seem to have anymore, <laughs> uh, even a one percent support in in a swing state can tip it. I think our I agree. Okay, <laughs> like it's you know his he. Um, doesn't have the kind of gravitas of if I go vote for this person, everyone's going to go do that, right? But the slimmest margins matter. I think yeah. more importantly, after, not RFK, it's whether, how the economy is going to continue to do, mm -hmm. whether or not she has a mistake that looks like something mm -hmm. in 2019 or in that first year of the vice presidency. There are other shoes that Democrats are scared that could drop, and a lot of that is out of her hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, I mean, certainly it could be in a, I mean, we don't really know what the effect is, but it, it also, though, it does sort of fit into the, the Democrats' framing of they're weird. I mean, if you want to, like, underscore the weird, other guys are weird strategy, yeah, I mean, adding, guy. adding, <laughs> adding, yeah, the bear code, the ear, worm, now the brain worm, whatever, that, I mean, that's going to... It was a bear and a brain worm. It, it was, whatever it is, though. it helps. <laughs> stories. Yeah, it no, feels no, no. kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, but it, I think that helps in that It's one right. less problem, yeah. right? It's one less problem no. because you look at the RFK campaign, I think yeah. it is, well, you it, look at the RFK campaign, and I think it was clear to many of us that he would have pulled some of the votes, and when you're playing a game of tricky margin, Mm -hmm. You don't want to leave that to chance. So, okay, it's one less one less question mark. Well, right. unless it tips the entire election. The right. Whole thing. I, mean, thing. Jill I mean, Jill Stein. Don't forget yeah. Jill, Jill Stein. Stein, Ralph you know, Nader. I mean, there's not a lot of there are there are, there are things that can happen. Correct. I mean, if you were yes. Trump, would you be happy about this? Would you be yeah. happy in a kind of question mark? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you think it'd make a meaningful difference? Pen versus pencil. I I, I want to I want to um, ask a well, it's sort of a pen and pencil question that I'm about to ask you. <laughs> um, it's a good transition, inadvertently. Uh, Such a something. Thank you. The um, uh, I'll buy two copies of this, <laughs> this book now. Um, Perfect. <laughs> yeah. The uh, I, I want to ask you about something that Kamala Harris is not doing, which is talking to the press. And I know that people think, oh, you guys are just special pleaders or, or whatever, the, the, the mainstream media. But the only way voters can see a candidate operate without a net without a script or a teleprompter is in a professional, professionally run interview. And so the question, turn to Eugene as the president of the White House <laughs> Correspondents Association, not that it's your problem directly, but, uh, but it's bothering me that they're, they're, they're holding her back from what I think of as a test 
one of many tests that a candidate should go through. No, you're 100% right. She has to do that. Because it's not just that we're complaining about it. I'm hearing that from voters. I'm not asking them, like, do you think she should do an interview? They're like, I haven't seen her unscripted. I think that it's great that she's reading off of a teleprompter, that she seems strong and powerful, but I want to see what she's going to do when you guys ask her about, you know, they called her the border czar. Why wasn't she? I want to see you yeah. ask her why, why she are, shouldn't. Why are they know, holding but, her back? Because I think they're, they, they, everything is going so well. Yes. Why risk yeah, with the right. risk? But you know, one thing that increases the pressure on her to do interviews is the experience with Joe Biden, where there is criticism that they held him back, they protected him, and American voters were unaware of what his mental acuity, what the costs of aging uh, that would have come out, perhaps, if he was doing interviews. Mark, I'll give you the last 30 seconds. You're the author of This Town. You understand the media. Can you hold politics. up a cup. <laughs> <laughs> You're Can the you author of copy? This Town uh, by Ali yeah, Vitale. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> ways. Well, um, the last 30 seconds to you. Uh, is, does this matter to anyone but us? Yeah, now, my, my journalist bone definitely is aching in that I, I want her to do this. I want her to be transparent. I want my colleagues, I want ideally me or you, um, <laughs> to be able to interview her. Or, or on, the, on the other <laughs> hand, I, I just what don't know if there are a lot of people out there who say, I'm not going to vote for her because she's not given a media yeah, interview. That's right. right. No, um, very good point. Um, unfortunately, we do need to leave it there for now. Um, I wish we can go on all night, but I want to thank our panelists for joining us and for sharing their reporting. And to our viewers at home, I want to thank you for joining us. For more election coverage, visit theatlantic.com, where you may or may not read an interview by Mark Leibovich of <laughs> Kamala Harris. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.